Our Father, we do thank Thee for Thy love and mercy and for the measure of health and strength that we enjoy. To be able to be in this place and to do what we're doing this day, please guide us and help us. May we be true to Thee. May we speak for Thee. We recognize our limitations. And we pray for the revealing work of Thy Spirit to be done in our lives so that we gain an understanding that would not be something we would have naturally, but the supernatural work of Thy Spirit, illumining, teaching, guiding us, would take place in this meeting. This we pray in Christ Jesus' name and for His glory. Amen. I'd like you to open your Bible to the prophecy of Isaiah, the sixth chapter. We're going to deal with a number of verses early on in the book of Isaiah and try to make one point again and again and again. And it is concerning our vision of God. Our vision of God. Remember that the Lord reveals Himself in His Word. The Bible is God's revelation of Himself. If you've never said it just that way, I think it's a good thing to say to your people. You may wish to write it down. The Bible is God's revelation of Himself. It's a book about God. It's not a book about David or Joseph or some Bible character or some event. It's a book about God. And God reveals Himself in those people, in those events, surrounding those people's lives. It's God's revelation of Himself. He's revealed Himself in conscience and creation. There's enough of the knowledge of God in conscience and creation to know that God exists, but not enough of the knowledge of God to show us the way of salvation. And we have this revelation of God in His Word, God revealing. When we deal with the Bible, we're dealing with inseparable supernatural truths the first of which is divine revelations. God does not create His existence. He reveals His existence as the Creator God. In the beginning, God created. So it is the supernatural work of revelation. We have it in words. and We believe in the verbally, plenarily inspired Word of God. Every word of it, all of it, it's God's Word. It's the revelation of God. God reveals Himself. And when we deal with God, we're dealing with the God of the Bible. He doesn't tell us everything He knows in the Bible, but everything He wants us to know, and in particular, as we're thinking now, everything He wants us to know about Himself. The biblical revelation is progressive. It begins with a declaration of the Creator God, and God reveals Himself progressively through the Bible. He gives us one thing after another. He calls himself by different names, associating his nature and character with those names to reveal himself. To find that we have the perfect revelation of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as God became a man without ceasing to be God. And Christ Jesus is the perfect revelation of our God to us. I heard Dr. Criswell say years ago when I was just a young preacher, back then a Southern Baptist pastor, He said many people have the idea that there are three gods and three visions of God, but that's not true. Uh, The only God we shall ever see is God the Son. The only God we shall ever know is God the Father. The only God we shall ever feel is God the Holy Spirit. Now that was his way of saying it. You may agree or disagree with that. But when we get to heaven, we're not going to see three gods. We have the revelation of the triune God in three persons, but... The Lord our God is one God. And we need a vision of Him. A vision of Him. I read a survey. I'm trying to find where it was taken from. They didn't have a footnote, unfortunately. But among Baptist churches, people interviewed, 58% of the people interviewed in Baptist churches said they did not believe that Jesus Christ was God. Now, How in the world can a person profess faith in God to know God, the only true God, if the only way to know Him is through His Son, the Lord Jesus, and not believe that Jesus is God? I think we'd be shocked at the revelation people have of God. But what is the biblical revelation of God? 
I give this supernatural statement here about revelation. It is a supernatural thing God has done, reveal Himself. And then, of course, we have the supernatural work of inspiration, the divine guarantee that we have what God wants us to have in His Word, and the supernatural work of preservation, and the supernatural work of illumination, those four inseparable supernatural truths concerning the Bible. God is always previous. You may wish to remember that. God is always previous. We find, of course, that illustrated so very well in the Garden of Eden as the Lord came to Adam when he sinned, crying out, Adam, where art thou? And he hid himself, Adam hid himself from the Lord. And we have that recorded for us in Scripture, but it is God revealing himself as the seeking, searching one. Just as Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, I'm come to seek and to save that which was lost. So there's nothing more important in our Christian life than having the right vision of God. May I repeat this many times as I'm dealing with this particular lecture, that our vision of God determines all else in our Christian life. And we need the right vision of God. That many times we talk so much about our country that we're apt to confuse people about our goals and objectives in preaching the Word of God. It's as though what we're doing is trying to straighten out everybody and straighten out the, the country. But what the preacher does, the pastor does, he declares, he declares the Lord. He's a herald of God's message and the declaration that God is. We believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. I'm deeply concerned about our country, of course, and if I could choose to be a member or a citizen of any country in the world, I wouldn't make any other choice. I'm glad and thankful to God that I'm a citizen of the United States of America. And what we're really praying for appears to people at times to be a, a political revival. But that's not at the heart of our issue we need more than a political revival. We need a spiritual awakening and a spiritual revival. And when we say spiritual, we have to, have to uh, qualify that as the Spirit of God moving and working. And may God help us as we try the spirits to know and recognize the Spirit of God. We must believe that God wants to intervene in our lives. Uh, the last little word down here, I said I had a survey that was completed compiled in a book called The Day America Told the Truth. It was published in 1991. I don't know if you want to get something that's been out that long, but uh, the consensus was there's no moral consensus in our country. Americans are making up the rules as they go, their own laws, their own codes. Only 13% of American citizens interviewed believe that all the Ten Commandments are now valid. Think of that. 60% of all Americans have been victims of a major crime. 58% of the people in America have been victimized twice. One in seven Americans has been sexually abused as a child. And on it goes. And when we're talking about what we need, we get the idea that we need to straighten out our country. Uh, John Locke, uh, historian John Locke, uh, famous in our own history from what we gain from his understanding of a nation, said so when we take the axe to something or someone, we should first take it to ourselves and our own need. And that's true. Most Americans have lost sight of God, the consciousness of the God of the Bible. America has become the most violent country in the world. Children's television programming now averages 25 violent acts per hour. It's not just preachers telling people that something should be done about these things. As a matter of fact, most preachers have gotten pretty quiet about the whole, whole subject. Whether we are adults or children, the sheer volume of violence we witness is numbing. I think we're almost dead to information because we've had an information overload. It's not information our country needs, it's truth. And the truth they need is the true vision of our God, the God of the Bible. Years ago, my oldest son cautioned me when I was preaching about the problems in our country. He said, it's great people need to hear these things, Dad. He's sitting in here now as a grown man and one of the vice presidents of our college. But he said, you need to leave people with hope, too. That was very good for me. 
Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Let's begin there, may we? Here's the heart of the issue. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings with twain. He covered his face with twain. He covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. I want you to note, if you're in the habit of marking things, the little word, then. And let's talk about what preceded that. Then. I believe that we've made the terrible mistake of calling on people to do things they have no intention of doing, no regard for doing, because they haven't seen what they should have seen. They should have seen the Lord, high, exalted, holy, lifted up. God help us. Notice the expression, the Lord, high, and lifted up. I've written here, a low view of God will never convict us of our sins. A low view of God will never motivate servants to go into his vineyard to give their lives to telling people about Jesus Christ. It might be possible for us to comprehend this, all of us, that so much of this lacking in the work of God is traced directly back to our low view of God. We do not see the Lord high, holy, and lifted up. I'd like to repeat this to you again and again and again. So much of what goes on in our churches, especially in the music world, could not take place. Could not take place if we had the right vision of God because we would not do those things in the presence of a holy God. It wouldn't be done. A Barnhouse tells a story of uh, Robert Dick Wilson coming to hear him speak at Princeton and he said, I'll only be here once. And, and after he heard him, he said, there's no reason for me to turn, return when you come back to speak because I only come to see if my students have a big God or a small God, if they have a high vision of God or a low view of God. If they have a high vision of God, then I know everything else in their lives will go like it ought to go. I remember cringing listening to a preacher give a title and uh, about daring God, double dog daring God and part of his title. And I thought, if you had the vision of God you ought to have, you could not speak a title for a sermon like that. You couldn't do that if you saw the Lord high, holy, exalted, lifted up as you ought to. And those kinds of things, those low views ultimately lead to the wrong life. Page 33, the second paragraph, the Bible says God created man in his own image. And here's the issue. This is what the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. But in Romans chapter 1, we find that man has attempted to create God in his image. So we reverse things. We've created a God instead of understanding that God created us. We live in a world of light and darkness. The Bible declares to us in 1 John 1, 5, God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Now, there's a dangerous light. It is the imitation light that promotes a deviant form of so-called Christianity. I think m many of us understand that there is this broad perimeter of Christendom, Christendom and within that, there's biblical Christianity. Years ago, when Jimmy Carter was in office as president, 
it became very popular to refer to people as born-again Christians. That's a redundant expression. We understand from the Bible if you're born again, you are a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you haven't been born again. So to say that would be like saying he's a Christian Christian. But it clarified for some people because there were people insisting that a man was a Christian when he had not been born again. And they were trying to say of Carter, he had a born again experience, he said. So he was a born again Christian. I don't know of anything in the world there's more confusion about than the Christian faith. And it's up to God's people to give clarification. But where is the clarification? It's not in our, our arguments or our propositions. The clarification comes in our vision of God. Please write this down. The clearer our vision of God, the clearer everything else will become. The clearer our vision of God, the clearer everything else will become. The devil does his most dastardly work, not as a roaring lion, but as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel... For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That's what his name implied before he fell, Lucifer. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So what's the devil doing today? I repeat to you the most difficult lie to deal with is the one that's nearest the truth, that is not the truth. So, where are the discerning people today? Where are the discerning people today? We are being overrun by demonic activity, but where are the discerning Christians today? People who know that's not of the Lord, that's not of the Spirit of Christ. You couldn't do that in the presence of a thrice holy God. That's man-centered not Christ-centered. If you begin with the flesh, the flesh will not be able to transform itself into the Spirit of God. Jesus said to Nicodemus when he came to Christ under the cover of darkness in John chapter 3, he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. It always will be flesh. So you can spit sign and polish it all you want to, dress it up, make it as lovely and as appealing as you can possibly make it, but it'll still be flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. If we worship God, we worship God in spirit and in truth. It's not a man-made, worked-up thing like a pep rally. Do you know of any place in the world where Christianity could get by with having choir contests to see who has the greatest church choir and hold the contest in Las Vegas, Nevada? A lady, a discerning woman who used to teach at the Philadelphia College of the Bible, now international something, uh, wrote a book on truth and one chapter had to do with Christianity meeting America. And the conclusion of the chapter is that when Christianity and America collided, Christianity won. No, America won. America won. And so what is our view of God? Watch for imitations that have all the dressings. You see, we want short-term success. We just think, well, if I could get it, if I could get it and get it quickly, you know, it's like impulse buying. I want this and want this now. I'm not giving much thought to it. And so uh, we think if, it, if, it, uh, if it's something that we can make happen, we'll make it happen. And if it works, it's bound to be right. Well, the Christian is under the impression because what he knows about God in the Bible, if it's right, God will make it work and he'll make it work in his time. In his time. And some of us are going to be called very foolish, out of date, out of step, off the wall. I have an interesting article, maybe one of our helpers could help me find it, that was published by an American paper when Spurgeon died. 
Spurgeon died in um, January 1892. And an American paper reported on this a few weeks later and said that Mr. Spurgeon was a man out of step with his times. That unfortunately, he held to 17th century theology in a 19th century world. Now that was the conclusion of one of the great Christian publications in America. That Spurgeon died as a failure. He died as a failure because he held, he held vigilantly to 17th century theology they called him the heir of the Puritans in a 19th century world. But today, in the 21st century, Mr. Spurgeon is the most read preacher who's ever lived. His work is so voluminous that it is, it is in greater volume than the entire Encyclopedia Britannica, still in print. Why? God has made sure that the truth is marching on, marching on. Now, he's not an apostle. He's not a Bible writer. <laughs> I heard Dr. Crystal say one time he didn't know who wrote Hebrews, but he thought maybe Spurgeon did. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> Because lots of men who have loved the Lord have been great fans of Charles Spurgeon. So the point is, you may find a quick fix, but you better look at your fix because it might be a long death instead of a quick fix. And it may take its time showing its, its true nature. But God help us to stay with the truth and see the Lord for who He is. I would ask this, do you believe at the end of life you're going to meet God? And of course you answer, yes, yes, but the idea of the God you're going to meet may not be the God of the Bible. Our churches are getting into trouble because we have allowed the image of God to be diminished. Would you mark that please? Many families are falling apart because we have allowed the image of God to be diminished. And the only way to victory, the only way, is by living consciously in the presence of God. Now we believe that God is omnipotent, almighty, He's omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, everywhere. But are we living consciously in the presence of God? May God guide us and help us. I gave two Bible examples in this introduction here, introductory part of this. One on Elijah, the prophet, standing before King Ahab. Ahab was a powerful man. And by the way, his wife was one of the, one of the most religious women to ever live. She was a Phoenician princess. She was a God worshiper. When you talk about Jezebel, don't forget she was an extremely religious woman. She had more prophets than you'll ever have pastors. She was very religious. But her God was not the God of the Bible. And when Elijah stood before Ahab, the Bible marks clearly that Elijah was standing in the presence of God before Ahab. In other words, the only way he could deal with Ahab was to see that God was greater than Ahab. Another example I've given here is on Moses facing Pharaoh. What we'd like to do, we'd like for God to kill all our Pharaohs, then we'll go to Egypt and tell, let the people go. If you'll just kill Pharaoh, we'll, we'll be home free. In other words, get rid of all of our problems, Lord. But it doesn't happen that way. God doesn't kill our Pharaohs, but He goes with us and He proves that He's greater than any Pharaoh we ever face. But only if the image we have of God, the vision we have of God is the God of the Bible. So what, what are we faced with here? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 1. And uh, I want you to follow along if you would please. And as we read this passage, passage of Scripture beginning with verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, 
a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole land is sick and the heart, whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land strangers devoured in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Oh, the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard and as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left us unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifice unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hated. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God says, even the way you go about your worship makes me sick. And because of it, when you pray, I will hide my face. I don't intend to hear you. You see, religious exercise is not enough when we've lost our vision of God. I said earlier to you, we need to offer a course. It seems everybody would want to major in it. How to have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Now God says when Paul wrote to Timothy those words, he said, from such turn away. But we see people flocking there. When Joel Osteen becomes the most popular preacher in America and there's so few, too few, maybe more than we imagine, but too few discerning Christians who think that's just great, isn't it? You see, I, I'm not sitting in judgment necessarily on Joel Osteen, though I would be happy to do that. That's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is there's such a loss of discerning and discerning spirit in this country. And it's affected our ranks. It's affected our ranks. What can we trace it all back to? Somebody says, I don't like that music. What music? Well, all that, all that music that they want to bring into our churches. Some of you have mentioned to me that, that people want to bring it into your church. Well, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? You say, I, I don't like all this elaborate stuff draping around the work of God. In other words, we just think we can't have simplicity and godly sincerity. We've we got to have an elaborate production. 
We've got to make so much of the humanity of Christ that we arouse the sympathy of people. Is that what we need? Sympathy for God? Does God want sympathy? Is that, is that what we want? When you have someone in a congregation saying, I can't wait to grow up to have the leading part in the drama of our church, I wonder how far removed that is from someone saying, God has dealt with me by His Holy Spirit. I'm surrendering my life to be a preacher of the gospel and willing to go anywhere in the world, no matter where, and face whatever I have to face because I know God is with me. There's a world of difference between those two things. But what are we going to do to turn the tide? Why can all this go on? How can people get by with this when it's become so man-centered? Why? John the Baptist said, I must decrease. He must increase. Less of me, more of him. Less of me, more of him. Less of me, more of him. Finally, none of me, all of him. What's gone wrong? We've lost our vision of God. We've recreated God in a very pleasing, non-offensive image. We've closed the gap between the world and the so-called church to make the church and its message less offensive to the world. We've created meetings where people are attracted to them. You say, well, well, shouldn't we be willing to have people come? Of course. All are welcome. But what's really gone wrong? And if you're saying, well, my argument is this. I just don't like, I don't like it. Some of it's not well done. Well, if it was well done, would you like it? I hear people say today that uh, our drama team is as good as folks on TV. Or I, say, I hear people say, well, our music, this contemporary thing we're doing is as good as anything you hear anywhere on any re- television program. Or you never see anything any better than what we do. Is that, is that the standard? Is that the standard? What's the real issue here, people? We've lost our vision of God. And who He is. And He alone is to be worshipped. And God said to His sinful, erring people, the motions you're going through, the feasts you have, the services you conduct, even the prayers you offer, make me sick. They make me sick. And you see, He doesn't share His glory. No flesh is to glory in His presence. But the reason there's so much flesh glory is there so little of His presence. Now, before I just go off on it, (laughs) as if I haven't already, I need to recognize that the great era is first in my own life. I have that same nature, that old nature. I want the attention just like Satan in the 14th chapter of Isaiah, by the way, just like you, Jesus said to his disciples, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, are we willing to admit that we're evil people and need the Lord? I'm talking about our vision of God. Our vision of God. I've been in some meetings when the Lord was so real that it was staggering. Prayer meetings when the Lord was so real. Church services when you really couldn't talk anymore. Very few. Very few. You see, there's so many people today trying to make church interesting instead of let the Lord be seen through us. Preachers now have developed a style of preaching to try to make their preaching interesting. They want to tell something that's way out there and, and enhance the whole thing with some, some story that's so dramatic that it captures people's attention. What happened to the Bible? Line upon line and precept upon precept. I don't know if we will ever return because we've gotten so accustomed to getting the glory we hate to give it up. I don't know, really. I don't know. I pray we will. I know this, we'll never have revival unless we do. What's the real issue? The real problem in America 
is the people of God, not Washington, D.C. or Hollywood. Has the world hurt our church or have our churches hurt the world? We need to answer that question, don't we? God help us. The reason we are not what we should be is because God does not have the place in our lives He should have. Please seek to understand this vital connection. This lies at the very heart of all else. All else. If you want to be the father God wants you to be, make God the God He should be in your life. If you want to be the mother God wants you to be, then we must have the Lord have His rightful place in our lives. If you want to be the pastor that God desires for you to be, the people deserve to have, then my Lord, as a pastor, my Lord must have the place in my life that He so richly deserves. The people who believe that God will someday judge America, don't kid yourself. The judgment of God has already begun in America. If He judged angels who sang before His presence, if He judged the old world that sinned, if He judged Sodom and Gomorrah, if God judged Jerusalem, do you think that He will judge America? Of course He will. Much given, much required. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. For Jerusalem is ruined. Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of His glory. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul. For they have rewarded evil unto themselves. God help us. Chapter 5, verse 20 in Isaiah. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. There was a day, I say there was a day, when people like A.W. Tozier, Vance Havner, people like that who truly knew God and knew something of the holiness of God. Let's say a man like uh, A.B. Simpson or A.T. Pearson or B.B. Warfield. Let's say a man like that that made contributions to us by the life they lived could have walked into some of our church services or some of our training meetings and gotten sick of what they saw. God help us. God help us. I ask you, do you not think it's time that judgment begins at the house of God? I do not know that we really want that kind of revival that comes that way because it comes at such a high price. These are not ordinary times. Is there anyone foolish enough to believe that these are ordinary times? And I want to tell you something. I caution you. What is the great problem? Is it that Iran is developing a nuclear weapon? Is it that Baghdad is falling this week after nearly 5,000 American lives have been lost there? And now we're talking about sending 200, 200 troops to guard our embassy, all of them who are probably in danger of losing their lives in the onslaught of terrorism that's flooding that city as terrorists on the march now to take Baghdad? Is that the issue? Is it the coming economic implosion of America? Is that, is that our real issue? Is it that the Chinese have run, run test runs on our technology and tried to cripple America three different times we're told and now are capable of shutting us down and the technology we have in this country. Is that our real issue? Is it that public education has become like public housing? If that's all you can get, so be it, but there's not much housing at all and not much school at all. Is that, is that our real issue here? What is the great issue? Is it that homosexuality has become the promotional thing of the day? Is, is, that, is that the real issue? If you could have cleaned up Sodom and Gomorrah, would that, would that have been the thing that would have taken care of everything in the Bible? 
You see, you and I have chased so many of the devil's rabbits that we are sidetracked. While we have an anemic church and a sick world, and a sick church that's anemic can't help a sick world, and it's going to cost something to produce the healthiness in a church that we need. As a matter of fact, people are going to say, you're not doing enough for my children. We, we need a religious shopping center if we're going to keep up with the order of the day. People want everything, everything. I mean, do you have an oil change group that comes in one day of the week just to help widows and single wives? I mean, do you have a weight loss program that meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays, two different days for different people? Uh, do, you, do you have all these things? I mean, shouldn't we be providing everything everybody needs and accommodating them on every front? No wonder God says, I'm weary of all this. Where's the real issue? We've lost our vision of God. And now we come from all that preliminary to our vision of God. Let me read this opening paragraph. The most sobering thing I have to think about is meeting God with the truth that his people could have done what was necessary to bring revival and they did not do it. As I back off from the White House to the church house to my house, I must surely ask with sincerity, where is God in my life? Will you think about where God is in your life? What kind of God do you see? What vision of God do you have? The Bible says in John chapter 20, verses 20 to 33, there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came unto Philip, which was of Bethsaida and of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come, that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world, the same shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. And now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Remember that God's glory is on display at Calvary. His glory. His holiness, His wrath, His love, His forgiveness. If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The people answered Him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. How sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whether he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah. Just read that, didn't we? Isaiah, the prophet might be fulfilled which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. 
In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah sees the unveiled Christ. Would you mark that? The Bible tells us in John 12, 41, that Isaiah saw the glory of Christ. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. This is the unveiling of Christ. If we're going to be the people God wants us to be, we must see the glory of Christ. Isaiah 6, 1 through 4, we have this vision of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple, and it stood the seraphims above it, stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of His glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. What is this vision of God? Isaiah the king had been on the throne for 52 years. He was the only king that many people knew. He, it was 740 years before the birth of Christ. Isaiah was a troubled man. The death of the king had troubled him greatly. He went into the temple. As he was in the temple, the place of worship, he received a vision of God. And the vision of God he received was the Lord sitting upon a throne. There was a troubled world, a troubled prophet, a troubled nation. Things went turmoil, but God was sitting on his throne. We must let our people know God is on his throne. The way we've talked about all the problems in the world and the issues in the Middle East all the way to Washington, D.C. has led people to believe that somehow the Lord has lost the reins of the world. But God is on His throne. It was a tragic day when the planes crashed in the World Trade Towers, the Pentagon, the field in Pennsylvania. But God is still on His throne. He's the God who has not been moved by the trouble of this world. And we need to see a God who is still seated on His throne. The reins of the universe are still in His hands. He is our God. The Bible says the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And His train filled the temple. This train was a robe of royalty that a king wore. This signifies greatness. The longer the train, the more exalted the king. God's train filled the temple. There were the seraphims. This is the only place you'll find them. There, there are cherubims and seraphims. These have to do with God's presence, God's judgment, and God's altar. The Bible says of these seraphims, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. He covered his face in the presence of God, not to look upon the face of God in all his glory. And with twain he covered his feet in humility. They covered their feet in the presence of God. I say to you, if the President of the United States walked in, we'd all stand to our feet. But if Jesus Christ came in, we'd all fall on our faces. Does that sound like our church services and the humility we ought to have before the Lord? Why? Why? Because we don't have the regulative worship that we ought to have that's demonstrated to us through historical settings that we know are true. We've created a new kind of worship today that exalts man and the singer and the knowledge and expertise of the speaker. And I'm sorry, it's dethroned God. And you can listen to this all you want to, but what's going to change it? The attitude of people who saw, say they know God, reveals to us the kind of God they say they know. This Flippant statements that people make about God reveals that there's not a God in their thinking who is high and holy and seated on His throne, whose train fills the temple, or else they would not talk about Him the way they do. The Bible says of these angelic beings, and with twain they did fly. They were ready to serve, to move at God's beckoning. The God that we know, the God of the Bible, the God who is holy, high, and lifted up, is a God before whom we should be ready to do whatever He asks us to do because of who He is. You do not have to ask in order to find out whether or not you want to do it. If you have the right vision of God, you're already surrendered to do whatever God wants you to do. And we get so little done with our people because they don't have the right vision of God. 
The Bible says one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 thrice holy God, God the Father, God the Son. Holy is God the Father. Holy is God the Son. Holy is God the Holy Ghost. The word holy means separate. He is not one of, but the one and only is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. What is your vision of God? I repeat, please write it down. Our vision of God determines everything else in our lives. All of my life is determined by my vision of God. Every time I have trouble with some peripheral thing, some external thing or person, some moment of anxious fear, I need to talk to the Lord, enter into God's presence and find help from God who enables me to deal with whatever it is. You see, the vision of God reduces everything else to its rightful size. But when we've lost vision of God, and the reason our people are so anxious and full of fear and our churches are missing what they should have is because we don't have the vision of God right. You and I need to determine to get along with God and His Word until we see the Lord for who He is. And it's going to be life-changing, sobering. And some of this cheap music that's being done, not all of it. Some new things are wonderfully done and have wonderful words. But so much of it does not have God-exalting words. And it reaches the emotions without ever getting to the Spirit. It doesn't exalt God as much as it exalts the performer. And that performance could not be given. You'd walk in if you had the presence of God upon your heart and mind, living consciously in His presence. You couldn't do all that stuff in the presence of a holy God. Amen. And the way we deal with this is not saying this is seven things I don't like about it. The way we deal with this is to bring again the presence of God to our lives like it ought to be as He ought to have His place in our lives. And dominate our lives, yes, but permeate everything else we do. And in that kind of in that kind of experience, other things, other things can't have life that shouldn't have life. This brings our vision of self. I want you to get this, our vision of self. Woe is me. Woe is me. And the reason we don't have woe is me is because our vision of self is so exalted, woe is me, for I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What brought us to this evaluation of self? Some sort of self-study? No. This is what we saw of self when we came into the light the light, the consuming fire of a thrice holy God. Then we got the vision of self. God is light. He's a consuming fire. He is a burning and shining light. When we come into God's presence, we see ourselves and we see things that, about us that we've never seen before. As a matter of fact, the subject of secret sins is not sins that we've committed in secret. Secret sins are the sins that are now hidden from us. And will not be uncovered until we come into the presence of God. You'll be confessing things you never thought about for a while because God's revealing things in your life and you want to be as clean with God as you can be. Then God begins to show us these things about our lives and we need to confess them to Him. The Bible says of Isaiah, He came into God's presence and He said, Woe is me, for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You and I never see ourselves as we should until we come to the presence of God. Now, look, the clearer our vision of God, the clearer everything else becomes. You say, I got a real problem with some people. You don't understand it. Until you get the clearer vision that comes from an exalted God in your life, and He clarifies, then our vision of service. Then the Bible says in verse 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, 
that you had taken with the tongs from off the altar. What coal? What altar? We are at the temple, the place of sacrifice. It is a place of burning coals, a place of blood, a place of atoning sacrifice. He is there where the sacrifice has been made on the altar. There is a holy God high and lifted up. And out of our reach, separate from sinners, there's no way on our own effort that we can approach this holy God. There's no way we can come near Him. The more we see of ourselves and our sin, the more we realize there's no way. This, there's such a gulf between that holy God and us as sinful people. Imagine that helpless moment, that helpless moment when we see God high, holy, lifted up and we see ourselves separated from that holy God. When's the last time you've experienced something like that in worship? We're just working to get everybody on board. We're trying to get God and all the people to agree with what we've discovered. Our preaching needs some adjusting, doesn't it? Our churches need it. Well, where is the fixed point of reference? I don't know. And I won't really know. Though I say it's the Bible, I won't understand the Bible like I ought to understand the Bible. I can't see it clearly without God's shining His light, the light of Himself on it. And so imagine that helpless moment. What am I to do? The seraphim comes to the altar, takes the burning coal from the altar, places it on the lips of Isaiah. And what he says to Isaiah, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now, may the Lord help me by His Spirit right now, Right now, I want to try, to try to do a little something here that I hope God will give clarity. When we see the Lord high exalted and lifted up and we see ourselves as we are, sinners, and we see this gulf between us and God, how, how is it that we get to God? He came to us. He came to us when the Lord Jesus Christ became a man without ceasing to be God. He came to us. He was made sin for us. He knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And as Isaiah was told, this coal from this fiery altar of sacrifice touched him and made him clean. You and I understand from that vivid picture that it's Christ who came and gave Himself for us. As we repent of our sin and by faith trust Him, He makes us clean and gives us the approach through Himself to God. We come not on our own merit. We build no merit of our own. We never will build merit on our own. But we come to God on His merit. And when we pray and approach the Lord, it's not like, hey, God, aren't you fortunate to have me? Boy, if you just had more like me. No, no, no. There's a deep humility there, knowing there's no way we could ever get to God apart from God coming to us. And so we come to the Lord on the merit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the way He's made that we might enter in and get to God. And out of a grateful heart, so thankful to God for all He's done for us, we're willing to say, whatever you want, whenever you want it, here am I, send me, send me. We've passed that then, these things have happened to us. We've passed that then, here am I, send me Lord, send me. And I'm going with gratitude to God because I've seen Him high, exalted, lifted up. The greatest privilege of my life is to serve Him. And I want to do it in a way that honors Him, our vision of God. If there's one thing we could work on 
that will correct everything else. It is getting the right vision of God. Our preaching, teaching, singing, motive, enlistment of people, the service of the Lord, the mission fields of the world that need laborers. Once we've been conquered by Calvary, that's it. That's it. Let's pray. Father, apply these things to us, to our lives. Help us, guide us, use us. In thy name we pray. Let's make just a bit of application here. You've got some place for notes observed to do according to all that is written at the end of this lecture. What do you need to do? If you start this way and say, I'm going back to my church and I'm going to straighten some people out, then you've made a mistake already. If you say, I'm going to get alone with God and God's word, I'm going to pray that God gives me the vision of God that I need. I want to be full of grace and truth. I want people to see the Lord Jesus in me. When I get in one of these flesh fits and we get into them often, I'm the guiltiest in the room. We're going to confess that to God as quickly as possible. Why? Why? Because we want to be right with God. We don't want anything to hinder our fellowship with our holy God. Giving God His rightful place will give everything else its rightful place. Let's say, I'm going to combat this music that's trying to get in our church. Don't do it. Don't do it. Just lead your people in verses of Scripture about a vision of God, how we should see the Lord, how people bowed fell on their faces before Him. What pleases the Lord? Give them truthful words if the words aren't exalting to the Lord. Not long ago, one of these contemporary songs was revealed to be a song somebody wrote about his girlfriend. It became one of the great popular songs in contemporary music. And the writer said, that was not even about God. He said, I'm not even a Christian. That was written to my girlfriend. Shouldn't some discerning Christian somewhere in a church have figured that out? When they saw the words were not clearly about Christ. And by the way, with all the things going on in deviant forms of Christianity or called Christianity, don't we need to do a real examination of words and songs and see if it's really speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ? Our vision of God.